Uh, so, Brett, what do you want to? I mean, do we go by uh, founder? Do you want to be distiller? Like, what, what, do, what do you? What do you go by here? Uh, co-founder. Yeah, that's fine. Co-founder, and then other you know, forklift operator, which is what we saw this morning. <laughs> forklift driver. Um, toilet bowl cleaner, floor cleaner, hose dragger, yep. whatever needs to get done. Yep. Hose, hose dragger. I like yeah. that one. Okay, cool. Lead lead hose dragger. <laughs> okay. Lead hose. I mean, there's a team. <laughs> there is. <laughs> you don't want to be the guy yeah. on the bottom. <laughs> this is episode 256 of Bourbon Pursuit. And as a listener, you know that this podcast is about news and interviews to keep you entertained on all things bourbon. But right now, it's a heavy time in our world. It's very difficult times. There's tension, there's anger, there's angst. But this past week, Fred Minnick, he hosted a panel on race and whiskey with Fawn Weaver of Uncle Nearest, Clay Risen of the New York Times, Melvin Keebler, Assistant General Manager at Jack Daniels, Dr. Michael Torrance, the president of Motlow College, Freddie Johnson of Buffalo Trace, Tracy Franklin of Glen Fittick, and Chris Montana, the master distiller and founder of Denord Craft Spirits in Minneapolis, which has endured catastrophic damages and losses during the riots. I encourage you to go. Please take the time to watch it. This important discussion talks about the current state of affairs and struggles, but there's an overall theme of hope. You can get the link to watch the panel discussion as well as the link to donate to the Denord Riot Recovery Fund in our show notes. All right, let's switch gears a little bit and hear some industry news. Even though worldwide alcohol volume sales increased slightly in 2019, it will be five years before the global industry rebounds from the ongoing COVID-19 crisis. And this is according to a comprehensive new research from the IWSR Drinks Market Analysis. The losses in the near complete shutdown of bars and restaurants across the world will not be offset by the upticks in liquor retail and e-commerce. IWSR expects that this will lead to double-digit declines in 2020, and it will estimate that it will take until 2024 to reach the 2019 pre-COVID levels. The American Distilling Institute has awarded three different distilling research grants through the ADI Research Endowment, which is an initiative that supports craft distilling by funding scientific research. And this year, the recipients of the distilling research grants are as follows. First is Eric Stroud. He's the owner and distiller at Mohawk Spirits Distillery in Canna Johari, New York. And his was to fabricate and test three stills dating back to the 16th and 17th centuries. Next is Robin Felder, the master distiller at Monte Piccolo Farm and Distillery in Charlottesville, Virginia, to assess the utility of molecular rotational resonance spectrometry in distilling quality control operations in three distillery settings. And lastly, it goes to Connor O'Driscoll, master distiller at Heaven Hill, to study how oxygen enters and interacts with distillate in whiskey barrels aged in various locations in aging warehouses. You can read the full details on each proposal with the link in our show notes. All right, on to some bourbon release news. Barrel Craft Spirits is introducing its first line of private release whiskey, the company's most ambitious project to date. Each of the 24 batches have around 150 to 180 bottles and feature a unique blend of barrels 18-year-old stocks of Kentucky whiskey, which are then finished in secondary barrels or casks, and they will have an SRP of around $109. Barrel Craft Spirits has added a special section to their website, which contains a full list of its offerings and suggestions on where to buy them, and you can get that with the link as well in our show notes. Wilderness Trail Distillery will release its first six-year-old bourbon on June 8th to celebrate the reopening of the Kentucky Bourbon Trail. This weeded, bottled and bond whiskey will be available exclusively at the distillery, although bottles can also be pre-purchased online for pickup. The cost is $75 plus tax. For today's episode, we traveled out to Woodenville, Washington and sat down with Brett Carlisle. He's one of the co-founders and we get an inside look on how they built one of the most explosive craft brands on the market today. We get to hear another story about the influence of the late, great Dave Pickerel, how he had it on this distillery's journey, as well as its rise into acquisition by Moet Hennessy. But don't worry, we also talk about insights into their production process and how their aging facility 
maps pretty close to Kentucky in their type of environment. While we were on our 24 hour adventure to Woodenville, we also selected two barrels of insanely delicious bourbon. And I'm excited to announce that after working with the Woodenville team, these barrels will be bottled as Pursuit Series. Our first barrel will be going on sale in late June, and the first access is going, as always, to our community of Patreon supporters. And here's a little teaser for the show notes on this barrel. Pear and cinnamon combined make this bourbon sublime. Collaboration with Woodenville Whiskey Company. You can get more information on Pursuit Series at PursuitSpirits.com. Joe from Barrel Bourbon wants to make sure that this message finds you healthy and safe. It's with that in mind that they have started selling directly through their website. Just visit BarrelBourbon.com and click Buy Now to get Barrel's cast strength products shipped right to your door. Now enjoy today's episode, and here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. The great Henry Clay once said that he used bourbon to lubricate the wheels of justice. Now, he was a statesman, and he used bourbon for conversation in Washington, D.C. to help get his way. And to this day, political lobbies will pour two fingers neat of something good to uh, kind of talk about their positions on something with a, with a prominent senator or congressman. Bourbon's been in political circles, well, since the very beginning. And today, I feel like the world needs a glass of bourbon. I feel like we need to sit down, not to get drunk, not to have a party, but we need to sit down and have a conversation. Now, I recently did that with, uh, with a, a panel on YouTube to talk about diversity and how the industry can be a conduit for change in diversity across the world. But something came out of that. Tracy Franklin, who's the um, brand ambassador for Glenfiddich, she talked a little bit about how you know, whiskey could be a conduit for a conversation. And how people who love whiskey can sit down and they can be of different races, they can be of different creeds. They can sit down and have a conversation and find some common ground. Now, I recently put the black box on my Instagram and Facebook. And I had a lot of people reach out to me and say they wanted to unfollow me. To say that they thought I was taking advantage of a moment or whatever. But they never asked me how I felt about the situation. They just made their own determination. And I know for a fact that if those same people sat down in a room with me over a glass of bourbon, they'd have a very different perspective because I would let them know how I feel. You can't convey how you feel on social media like you can in person. And I've had some of the greatest conversations in the world with people that I disagree with over a glass of bourbon. So when I say the world needs a drink, I don't mean it's because we need to get drunk and get over the moment. It's because we need to get back to talking to one another. We need to be back in the same room again and just sip and talk about bourbon. And that's this week's Above the Char. Be safe out there. Cheers. Welcome back to the episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. Kenny and Ryan, out of our usual territory, heading into another state. Uh, not Indiana, not Tennessee, but all the way out in Washington, right? So, Yeah, usually I complain about the drive to Bardstown or Lexington or Frankfurt. Mm-hmm. Now we had a six hour flight to Seattle. It was great though. Yeah, no, this is a, this is a fun opportunity for us. You know, we're actually out here selecting barrels for pursuit series and we had, we said, you know, let's bring the recording equipment because we're fascinated by the whiskey of what this company's putting out. And we really just wanted to capture the story of, you know, one of the founders that we have here with us today. And I think it's, uh, I mean, like I said, we've just been blown away by it. Yeah. We got a sample or a sample bottle maybe two years ago and we got it and a lot of people send us samples, you know, startup distilleries, and we're like, oh, here we go. Another, not, a, not another one. Another craft distillery. And, uh, but this one in particular really stood out, and we were like immediately blown away and like immediately sent them an email and we're like, we want to buy some of your whiskey. Like, and, <laughs> we want, and so, uh, 
No, I'm super excited to be here. It's like a, it's crazy. We've come from my basement to Seattle. It's like. You know, it's fun. It's yeah. a fun. It's a fun journey. You know, and and one of the big reasons why we're here and actually doing this is because when Fred Minnick was doing his Whiskey of the Year competition, I was part of the. the not even Whiskey of the Year is actually he was doing like Pappy versus the Field, and and part of doing that, they asked me to say, hey, can you go ahead and get a blind sample sent or blind sample set up and go ahead and do this. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go through here. I'm going to taste some things that, you know, maybe they're not weeded products, but you know, they have this more or less this like caramel, this balance that could, you could almost like, almost like fake for a pappy. And so I tasted the Woodenville and I was like, this one might throw them for a loop a little bit. Right. I mean, I tried doing some things of like mixing old Weller antique with Elijah Craig 18, like trying to find that, that kind of particular mouthfeel. But this one, I think just blew them away. And like I said, one thing led to another. Now we're here. So it's fan- fantastic that we can actually do this. Yep. For sure. Super excited about this one. Yeah. So on the show today, let's, let's finally get to it. Right. Yeah. So today we have one of the founders, a co-founder of Woodenville whiskey company, Brett Carlisle. He is again, a co-founder. We were in here earlier. We saw him using the fork lift to drop off some uh, new corn that just got yep. delivered. He's, he's the lead hose dragger. Yes. You know. He's uh, he's a man of all trades here. Yes. So, Brett, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. Thanks for coming out. This is uh, pretty awesome. To, if you would have asked me 10 years ago when we started this business, if we we're going to have people coming out to visit us and do a podcast about our whiskey, I would have told you you're crazy. Yeah. So this is actually pretty awesome. Us too. So, <laughs> we're in the same boat. <laughs> this is pretty surreal for all of us. <laughs> so let's let's kind of rewind back. Um, you know, let's let's go beyond 10 years here. So one thing we typically ask our guests when they come on is like, you know, are you into whiskey? Like be, before this, like were you, uh, can you remember your first kind of bottle? Like was it with your, your dad or your grandpa or anything like that? Um, yes, definitely was into whiskey before we started this. Um, in college, didn't have any money, so my selections were at the very bottom of the shelf. Mm-hmm. But uh, a lot of my friends drank Canadian whiskey, and I back then actually had taste back then. I, I refused to drink Canadian whiskey, so <laughs> um, I was always drinking the bottom shelf bourbons because I liked the more flavor in that product. Um, after college, I uh, actually got a job and started making money so I could actually. I experiment more with stuff higher up the shelf. And so Orlin and I, my best friend and, and co-founder with me, um, that was kind of our thing. We played poker with friends all the time on the weekends, and we'd always try to bring a different bottle to share with everybody. And that was our thing. Um, trying new whiskeys, and mainly like bourbons and rye. American whiskey was our thing. What kind of selections did you have back then here? You know, we were, um, up until 2014, we were uh, a a state run liquor store state. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have any great selections. We had the standard fare. So, um, unfortunately we're not like you guys in Kentucky where you have all this wonderful bourbon at your, at your fingertips. So let's fast forward just now a little bit. Um, so you're getting together, getting bourbon, trying to get into it. What was that idea that said, all right, let's start a distillery, right? Because anybody that starts a distillery knows it's like the dumbest idea in the world because there's so much capital investment and everything that goes along into it. Yeah. If you asked me today, if I would do this again, I would tell you, (laughs) hell no. I think we were just, uh, ignorance is bliss. We didn't know what we were really getting ourselves into. We knew what we wanted to do. And we had this dream that we were going to do it. Nothing was going to stop us. And once we were fully invested into it, there was no, there's no turning back. We, we basically sold houses. We cashed in 401ks to start to fund this business. We didn't have any outside investors, just us two. Um, we did it and we, we tried to get a loan, um, from a, from a bank to help fund our, ca- our capital expenditures in the beginning. And that proved challenging. This was 2010. So the financial crisis had happened. Um, all these banks were going defunct. So, People weren't wanting to lend to a startup whiskey distillery in Woodenville, Washington. We'll pay you back in five years. We promise. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So we just, we did, I think 11 banks told us no. And I think on the 12th thing, we did our sales pitch, our business plan, and we were expecting a no. And uh, the lady said, I I believe in your your story and I believe in your your business plan. I'm going to loan you the money. We're like, okay, thank you, thank you, yeah, I appreciate your time. Just already anticipating the no. She's like, I don't think you understand. No, I, <laughs> I think I'm going to give you the money you need to get this business going. So at that point, we were just like, holy crap, this actually is going to happen. 
Um, so once we uh, got our SBA loan, uh, we we already knew the equipment we wanted. We we sent the check and got the equipment on order, and then just kept working on getting the business off the ground from there. How did you know what you wanted? Like, were you researching, or like you had yep. worked in the distillery? Industry? Great in- question. We we had no idea how watching to make- YouTube videos. You know, <laughs> it's like I think that's what we need. Back back in two thousand and ten, there were there was there's hardly any online resources on whiskey making. You could find anything you wanted on beer making, wine making, but whiskey making, you couldn't. Uh, so we did a lot of cold calling, phone calls. Uh, we talked to a lot of still manufacturers, asking their opinions. And uh, in a roundabout way, we got a hold of um, a man named Dave Pickerel, who uh, started consulting with us in the beginning. He, we got his number from a still manufacturer in the beginning. We, call, we called Dave up. And just kind of told him our plan. And he's just like, hold on, hold, hold on, hold on. I'm out shopping with my family right now. I'll call you back. He never called back. <laughs> so not surprising. I mean, two guys from Washington wanted to make bourbon and spitting your whole business plan out over the phone. So we were kind of discouraged, but we knew we needed somebody with expertise to teach us the right way. Um, just to flatten that learning curve in the beginning since we had no idea how to produce whiskey. We didn't, we didn't come from a distilling family. We weren't, we weren't from Kentucky. So we needed some outside help. You saying you didn't have your grandpappy's yeast that you could then bring in here and then start building the business uh, off of it. You know, yeah, we, we found an old recipe up in the attic and we're recreating that. <laughs> <laughs> not so much. No, not at all. So undaunted, we, we heard Dave was going to be at whiskey fest in Chicago and it was going to be doing a talk there. So you stalked him. We stalked him. So we bought, um, we didn't have enough money to, for us to both go. So we bought a VIP ticket to get in early. I said, Orlin, get on the plane, go out there, meet him in person, tell him how serious we are. So Orlin flew out, got in early, walked up to Dave and said, Dave, I'm Orlin Sorensen. Um, you don't, you don't answer my phone calls, but <laughs> you don't call me any, you don't call me back, but I'm here to show you how serious we are about wanting your help to start this whiskey distillery. And at that point, Dave was like, for you to fly out here to do this, that, that means you're very serious and I'm, I'm completely on board. So uh, a couple of weeks later, Dave was out um, and he was literally there the first day we were grinding corn and doing our first mash, teaching us every step of the process. Talk about that process with Dave Pickerel. Does he show up just like, all right, here's my blueprint, you know, let's go through each step and like... Ha- talk about that process or that, if you can. Or was, or was he there also in, in, in the equipment purchasing phase and he was like no 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 you need this versus this or so like that. we we actually um we actually had talked to him about equipment and he was uh pushing us towards one manufacturer but we were actually leaning towards a different manufacturer that we ended up going with they're a manufacturer out of germany and um for the still correct for the still yeah yeah just just for the still yeah, yeah we, we we've heard about them before yeah so you know, he gave us his opinions, but at the end of the day, you guys buy what you want to buy. We can, I can, we can make whiskey on any still. So, um, actually, a funny story: when Dave first showed up, we picked him up from the airport, and our first distillery location was about a mile from here, and it was in a multi-tenant uh, warehouse. So we basically had to remodel the whole thing and get it ready for our, all of our distilling equipment. Well, the back concrete, we had to saw cut it up, put floor drains in. It just didn't look. It didn't look pretty, and we had this beautiful still we wanted to install there. So we um, we did this uh, heavy-duty urethane coating that goes o- over the concrete, and it was like a like a light blue color, and it just an indestructible floor coating, but it kind of looked at a distance like carpet, and they actually they call it ceramic carpet. So Dave walks into the distillery up in the tasting room, and he's I see him looking in the back in the production area, and he's just got this weird look on his face. And uh, I was like, is something wrong? He said, no, 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 no. So he walks back there and he's just like, oh, thank God. And I'm like, what? And he's like, I thought you guys done put carpet on the production floor. <laughs> I'm like, this is a first. <laughs> so he was about ready to turn around and walk out if we had yeah. put carpet in there. The bacteria just starts building up yeah, from there. Yeah, for sure. And so, yeah, so like, let's, let's move on down this path. So you've got... Yet Dave Pickerel now, he's on board. He's kind of teaching you the ropes. And, and you know, when Dave does these things, he's usually fly in. He's there for a week, maybe two, something like that, teach you the ropes. And then what happened after there? Was he just saying like, all right, you know, best of luck. Call me when you need something and and talk about, you know, the first distillate and what that kind of experience was like too. So we, 
we knew we wanted Dave to be heavy handed in the beginning. So um, we signed a contract with Dave to be there as much as we needed him. So early on, he wasn't consulting as much as he was down the road. So we actually stole a lot of his time in the beginning. He was out at, for, for months at a time uh, wow. with us. So obviously we all know Dave was a chemical engineer by trade. He was the master distiller at Maker's Mark for 14 years. Um, he knew his stuff. He was brilliant. So you could ask him a question and he had a math problem that he could give you the answer to in, in five minutes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I never asked the guy a question that he didn't have an answer to. So, I mean, he might have been full of BS half the time, but he was uh, one of the smartest men we ever came across in this industry. Now, one of the questions or one of the things you guys talked about a little bit earlier was, you know, you're going out and you're looking for loans and you try to talk to banks and you, you know, you're trying also to convince Dave to come to Woodenville. So why Woodenville? I mean, is this where you grew up or is there something that like maybe you want to get out of the metro area? Kind of talk about that. Great question. Uh, so Orland and I actually grew up uh, in a town neighboring Woodenville called Bothell. So we went to Bothell High School together and uh, we set up shop in Woodenville mainly because there's already built-in tourism for wineries. There's 110 winery tasting rooms in this tiny little city of Woodenville. It's got a population of like 12,000. So it's already, people are already out tasting uh, products. So we thought that we've already got tourism built in. If we set our distillery up in Woodenville, uh, we could probably capture some of that winery tourism into the whiskey distillery. I mean, that was probably a solid business plan. I mean, we yeah. were we were driving in here, and then it was like, oh, there's a there's a there's a winery, there's a winery, there's a winery. I mean, it's literally they're all around us right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When, before we came here, my wife's like, oh, Chateau Saint Michel's right there, you know, which she drinks. I was like, yeah, it is. So, <laughs> yeah, they <laughs> I'll are, take pictures for you. They are our next door neighbor. So, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. All right, so now now you've got this part. We're starting to distill. Um, you've got your and kind of talk about like the first products as well because. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, and where you got your mash bill? How'd you come up with your first oh, recipe? Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you kind of talk about that a little bit as well, because you know, usually it's an experimentation phase, and I'm sure Dave had a role to play in this as well. Yep. So in the beginning, we knew uh, we wanted to play around with wheat and rye uh, for our bourbon mash, and so Dave was like, "I can give you Maker's Mark's mash bill, but you can't out Maker's Makers. That's just it. You know, you, why why would you want to copy somebody else?" So in the beginning, we tried, we did a couple mashes with corn, uh, wheat, and then barley. And then we did corn, rye, and barley. So we did the mashes, distilled them all out, and tasted them, and tasted the differences. Um, at the end of the day, we, Orlin and I, liked the, the rye versus the wheat for our flavoring grain and our bourbon. So we actually did barrel that, that wheated bourbon, and it's long been sold off, mm -hmm. but... Uh, we actually have more in the pipeline that we actually made recently again, just because. Because now you can do it. We can do it. Yeah. And it, it's something fun to do. But uh, as far as the ratios of our corn and our rye and our, and our barley, we just kind of kept tweaking them in the beginning to our liking. We taste the distillate and we were kind of looking for that, that rye spice to pop. Mm -hmm. Were you trying to create like a Washington style whiskey or just kind of. Just uh, yeah, not really. We weren't not trying. Really. To, okay. We weren't. We weren't trying to model it after anything out there. We wanted to kind of put our own unique spin on things. I was about to say, what's a Washington style I whiskey? Know. Yeah, there, I mean, we <laughs> well, were. This is the only Washington whiskey I've had. So. <laughs> <laughs> they might be the trendsetters. Well, know. we just we knew that most typical bourbons you have eight to ten percent rye in their mash, right? It's mainly corn, malt, and uh, eight to ten percent rye. So we knew we wanted to bump up that rye content. So we went. We ended up. After all of our tests, doing uh, we're seventy two percent corn, twenty two percent rye, and six percent malt. So we've got a pretty high rye uh, mash bill. And you're also trying to follow along with that that I want to say farm to table, basically like farm to still methodology here too. Correct. Correct. So we buy all of our grains from uh, one uh, small third generation family farm over in central Washington. So it's about two and a half hours from the distillery. So it's the, uh, the picking up a theme here. What's that? Well, everything's everything's two 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 to two and a half hours away <laughs> from the distillery. Well, we had we had the opportunity in the beginning, and that was our business plan. Um, we wanted to do everything local if we could. So, um, local grains. Why why buy grains from from Iowa for your corn or Canada for your rye when you have all this awesome agriculture in Washington State? Mm -hmm. So, and why not partner with a 
with a family farm where you know where your grain is coming from every day. So you, versus buying in bulk from a big supplier where you have no idea what farm that is. So we wanted to kind of connect it back with, with the whole farm uh, thing and know actually where your, where your uh, raw ingredient is coming from. Yeah, I guess you have the advantage of growing rye here decently, whereas in Kentucky we can't yeah. grow it worth shit. Too, many, too much humidity. But yep. uh, it grows actually pretty good. Talk about uh, some of the stumbling blocks or f- like, I don't want to say failures, but like talk about some of the early distillations and like, was it like a success out of the gate or was it just like, talk about that because yeah. I'm curious. Yeah, we get asked that a lot and um, and that's why we had Dave there. So he let us do our thing, but he was there to rein us back in when we were trying to do something stupid on the still or do something stupid in the mash. So he actually said he really loved uh, working with us because we didn't have any bad habits. We didn't come from a brewing background or a winemaking background. We, we were basically a blank slate and we were sucking up all the information he was giving us. And, you know, we, we took a lot of his advice and basically implemented it in, into our business plan going forward. And, you know, some of the best things he ever taught us is what made us successful in my opinion Mm -hmm. Um, we saw other distilleries out there uh, trying to expand at all these different states right away before they had even 5,000 cases of product and dave always said his number one thing was before you leave the state win your backyard Mm -hmm. you you're the local boy win your backyard crush your home market and then when you're doing that then you can venture out to other markets but what what good is that for your business if you're selling five cases and this state and 10 cases in that state. It's not sustainable. How long did it take to you felt like that you were crushing it in your own backyard? Well, we obviously, as a startup whiskey distillery, it takes time to age that whiskey, right? So in our early days, we were, um, we were bottling White Dog and selling White Dog. Um, we were making a vodka, just stuff to keep the, keep the doors open, the lights on and grain coming in the back door and barrels coming in the back door so we can continue to pr- uh, produce every day. And and keep filling up the warehouses with whiskey. I heard that you all also doing something unique where you were like a like a do your own barrel kind of at home sort of thing. Kind of kind of talk about what that was. Yeah, so like I said, we had to we had to be scrappy in the beginning and find different ways to keep cash flow coming in the door so we could just our ultimate goal was to have a fully matured bourbon and rye whiskey in a 53 gallon barrel. And financially that is tough as a startup business with without deep pockets when it's all self-funded so that um we were we were making our white dog and like i said we're in a wine industry a wine area and people kept coming in and didn't quite understand the barrel aging process for whiskey they thought whiskey came off the still brown (laughs) nope sure does no it does not so (laughs) at least our audience knows that orlin and i were talking like wouldn't that be cool if we could somehow show the consumer how whiskey goes from clear to brown and aged. And we, we found these little two liter barrels and we started experimenting with them in the distillery. And it actually turned out to make a pretty dang good aged product in a short period of time. So we developed this kit and the packaging worked with the designer on this thing. And uh, it was a huge success. People were just fascinated by it, that they could actually buy this little two liter barrel, put two fifths of of clear whiskey in it, and two to four months later, they have an aged product that's really good and drinkable. Merrick, what's the, I guess, what's the bourbon scene around our whiskey scene? Is it mostly Scotch drinkers or Canadian whiskey drinkers? Or out, what? out here? Yes. I think when we started, we were a lot of, lot of uh, Canadian whiskey drinkers out here. Obviously, in our, our proximity to, to Canada doesn't help that. <laughs> right. But, <laughs> sure. But as, as, that bur- would make sense. as bourbon has boomed everywhere, it's boomed out here as well. Bourbon is very hot out here as well. And I, I think our timing was impeccable when we yeah. started. I didn't know if it was like really hard to convince you like, no, bourbon's where it's at, you know, drop that Canadian stuff, you know. This- it, it, it was in the beginning. It was tough. A lot of people, you come in, what's your favorite whiskey? Crown Royal. Crown Royal. So. Seagram's and Seven. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Fighting the uphill battle there. So I, I, we kind of, uh, we got lucky as we were producing stuff, working on our brand, selling our white dog whiskey, selling our barrel aging kits, and waiting for our whiskey to mature, uh, bourbon popularity continued to grow around the country and obviously continued to grow out here. Absolutely. I kind of talk a little bit more about, you know, what did it take to the, to the point where you're aging and bottling the product that you have today? Um, and of course, I know it all takes time, but I'm, I'm thinking that the, the Woodenville 
Uh, what's what's coming out today is around a five year product, right? Correct. So kind of talk about you know when did that time come when you're bottling your your five year product for it to become a you know sort of a release that you're you kind of like experience today. So. Um, like I said, there were stepping stones along the way. We did our, our, our clear whiskeys, our vodka, and then we, we age whiskey as well in uh, small barrels, eight gallon barrels in size. So we were a whiskey company, so we, we couldn't wait a full five years to have a, a brown liquor in a bottle. So we were aging in our small barrels. So those are about a year and a half, two years aging in those. And then, so we were in business for about two years and then we had brown whiskey in a bottle and that actually those barrels are so cute when you see them <laughs> they are <laughs> they're really cute so ador- they're so adorable <laughs> they are yeah you use it as a christmas ornament almost right <laughs> they, they are cute but uh they're a pain in the ass to deal with talk about what was it like uh you know i think it's cool for when we pick out single, talk, talk about what's like when you make whiskey and then you see it like two three years as it matured what, what does that feel like or what what do you it's kind of like watching a child grow i mean you you made this this uh, this raw, um, unrefined product, and as it goes in this barrel, and it's growing up in a sense, right? Becoming more refined, more mature, and then to kind of taste it along the way, it's it's kind of cool to see because I I know what the base spirit tastes like, and then to taste it at different points throughout its maturation process, and then to finally get to the point where we deem it's ready for being bottled is is a it's a pretty cool ride. How long? How far along into it were you like, all right? This is like some good juice we got here. Um, yeah, it's true because we, we taste a lot of stuff and yeah. a lot of bad stuff at <clears throat> four or five years old. And so, yeah, kind of what was that that aha moment when we were like, holy shit, we dialed it in. Yeah, it, it was about, that was the scary thing is we kept asking Dave, we're like, all right, so we're investing all this money in this this raw product that we've never tasted white dog before. You tell us it's a great white dog. <laughs> We're just trusting you that we're going to sit in this barrel and, and in four to five, six, how many years is going to be great. And he just kept telling us, he goes, trust me, I've tasted a lot of white dog in my day and you guys are making a very, very awesome white dog. It's going to be a great whiskey. So at about the three year mark, we, it really started turning the corner, the, the, the whiskey. And so we were actually getting pretty excited because up to that point, really bready tasting, really, you can really taste that that raw distillate in there still, and it's mm-hmm. really green tasting. At the three-year mark, we started to get excited because it started to pick up some of that barrel character. We knew we wanted to go at least four years because we wanted a non-age statement, uh, straight bourbon. So at the four-year mark, we tasted it again. We're like, man, this, this is pretty dang good. But let's just let it keep going because you know once we open that door, there's no closing it. Yeah. Once we start to bottle that stuff, we got to keep bottling the stuff behind it. So we, at about four years, eight months, uh, we were like, holy crap, this is, this is really freaking good. We need to bottle this. But we're like, why not just go the extra few months and make it to five years? I'm just <laughs> surprised you that, that this team didn't go. And we were like, well, let's just go for six. At, <laughs> yeah. at the, at the five-year like, oh, five point, we were just like, wow, this is, this is amazing. This, this is beyond our wildest dreams, how this product actually turned out. So and that's kind of our spec. We, all, we shoot, everything's about five years old for our for our bottling spec. All right, so now- Let's talk about the- Yeah, yeah let's talk about the whiskey for sure first. Mm-hmm. So kind of talk about a little bit, you know, you kind of gave us a, a rundown of the, the bourbon mash bill. Did he do that already? I think so, do but it I again. can't remember. Do it again, <laughs> yes, just, for just, for, just for refreshing. Okay, so our bourbon, um, it's 72% corn, 22% rye, and 6% malted barley. What's the entry proof going on on this too? So we go in the barrel at 110. Mm-hmm. Low entry proof, nice. Yes. Which is probably a, a good indication of why it tastes so good at a at a five year range and stuff like that too. So we were in the beginning we were toying with entry proofs and uh, that was actually a recommendation by Dave. Um, he said you know most people barrel at one twenty five because they can get more alcohol per barrel, but then when you go to bottle it, you're diluting it a heck of a lot more to get it down to bottle proof. He said if you go at one ten, um, it extracts differently than at one at one twenty five, and you're diluting it less after aging to go into a bottle. He thinks you're going to have a more robust whiskey. Mm-hmm. So that's the advice we took, and um, we like the results for sure. Nailed it. What, why'd you do 90 proof? There are more craft distilleries popping up around the country now more than ever before. So how do you find the best stories and the best flavors? 
Well, Rackhouse Whiskey Club is a Whiskey of the Month club, and they're on a mission to uncover the best flavors and stories that craft distilleries across the U.S. have to offer. Rackhouse's box ship out every two months to 39 states across the U.S. In Rackhouse's April box, they're featuring a distillery that mixes Seattle craft, Texas heritage, and Scottish know-how. Rackhouse Whiskey Club is shipping out two whiskeys from Two Bar Spirits located near downtown Seattle, including their straight bourbon. Go to RackhouseWhiskeyClub.com to check it out and try some for yourself. Use code PURSUIT for $25 off your first box. What, why'd you do 90 proof versus like doing a bald and bond or doing 94 or what? Great question. We actually did a bunch of research on that as well. We knew we didn't want to just do the standard 80. Um, but when doing all of our research, 90% of people drink bourbon between 80 and 86 is what we found or 80 and 90. Um, it's only like the guys like you, the guys that are really into whiskeys that like the higher proof stuff. Sure. So we wanted to be able to, um, appeal to the masses and then we could do some cast strength stuff. We could do some higher proof stuff for the guys that are really into the whiskeys. We weren't set on 90 proof. We actually, we started taking the whiskeys and we started at, um, a hundred and hundred proof and proofed everything down a proof point all the way down to 86 and started tasting everything in between. And so Orlin and I, after tasting them all thought 90 proof was the sweet spot for this. It appealed to the most, uh, the most amount of people at that 90 proof range. And then I can also see from the barrels behind us and what we have out here, you have a, a strong partnership with Independence Dave. So kind of talk about the barrel, what yeah. you do. Is there anything unique about it or is it just standard char four? Like nope. talk about it. Um, in the beginning, um, Dave connected us with Independence Dave and we asked a lot of questions because we asked lots of questions. It's the best way to learn. And we just said, all right, what, you know, the standard bourbon barrel, it's a, it's a kiln dried barrel. It is a four, three or four char and, um, off it goes to be filled with whiskey. Are there different things that you can do to this barrel to make a better whiskey? And they said, we've done a lot of research and they sent us all their research on barrel treatments. And we read the research and worked with them and they actually had some suggestions. We said, well, we don't have all, a bunch of time. We don't have years to, to guess. We need to make a guess at what barrel we want in the beginning. And they loved all the questions and they said, would you guys want to do a study with us? We'll, we will send you uh, 24 barrels um, with six different treatments. You guys put the whiskey in and then we'll run a GC analysis on the whiskey every year and we'll see what the level of extractives are in each different barrel treatment. So we actually did this study with them for, for four years. Quick question before you get there. Why did they want to do that with you? Um, I think they just liked all the questions we were asking. They said, most people don't call us and ask all these questions. Most people just call us and say, I want to buy barrels. What do you got? And so I think they were, they liked that we were inquisitive and they thought that, Hey, you know, well, and you're probably like, hell yeah, we'll take free barrels. Well, yeah. <laughs> you know, you're a startup. Absolutely. Yeah. So based on what we read and what we discussed with them, we kind of hedged our bets and picked a barrel in the beginning, uh, a barrel spec that we wanted. Um, we knew that based on our reading that seasoning of the barrel was very important seasoning meaning the tree is cut down it's cut into barrel staves it's stacked out in the open elements outside um for a length of time so our spec is 18 to 24 months air air seasoned wood outside so what that does is it actually starts breaking down the lignin and the oak and um you actually grow a fungus on the wood so when that barrel is actually made that, that lignin and all the wood is more susceptible to interacting with the whiskey quicker. Mm -hmm. Nothing like a good fungus in your whiskey. Absolutely. Sure. <laughs> I like mushrooms, you know. Yeah. Have you guys ever been to Independence Dave? And yes. Oh, yeah. So you've seen all that wood stacked outside, right? It's all grayed and looks disgusting. You're like, how is that going to make a whiskey barrel? That's what I thought. Mm -hmm. So Yeah. Yeah. It's always a surprising thing and how the magic works inside the barrel. Yeah. It really is. It really is. It's like you don't want to know how the sausage is made, you know, with the, the fungus on this the This is the best kind of sausage <laughs> yeah. made, though. I guess that, that's what I would say. Also, um, so we, we knew we wanted to do a seasoned season wood. So, you know, everything we wanted to do to that barrel was just going to drive the cost up. But at the end of the day, we're not trying to mass produce a whiskey. We're trying to make a better whiskey. That was our goal in the beginning. Quality ingredients, um, distilled properly, uh, quality fermentations and mashing, and then the barrel, which is very, very important to the final product. So we weren't going to skimp on that. 
But um, we also, our barrels have to be charred by law, but nothing says you can't toast them. So we actually toast our barrels as well. So charring is 45 seconds, toasting is 45 minutes, right? So toasting just caramelizes the wood sugars deeper than a char can. So we toast all of our heads and then char the body of the barrel. So you're getting a lot more of that caramelized wood sugar from the toast based on their research and, and the results of our study after, after four years on that barrel treatment. Talk about your uh, warehouses and like work or warehouse or location. Cause it's not here where we are. It's two and a half hours away. Correct. Like everything else. But, uh, talk it, about that. So that kind of came about, we were in the beginning, we were storing our whiskey on site and then we kind of quickly realized it wasn't feasible to store that much, as much whiskey as we wanted to make on site. We were running out of space. So our, our farmer, Arnie, he actually said, Hey, I will build you guys a barrel warehouse, uh, on my property. And if things for as much free whiskey as I can take, no, it was, he's, at this point, Just in the, leave me a DeWalt. At, yeah. at, at this point in the relationship, uh, he, he wasn't sure how serious we were about our, our growth and, and our viability. But he said, you know, at the end of the day, if it doesn't work out, I've always wanted a big storage shed for all my, whiskey, all, my, all my tractors, right? So we said, yeah, let's, let's do it. We'll lease it from you. So he built the first warehouse. Uh, we went over there and we put all the ricking up inside and we started loading barrels in it. And uh, he, we got a call one day. He said, uh, hey, boys, you haven't been over here in a while, but we should probably build another warehouse. This one's almost full. <laughs> So we just didn't realize how much whiskey we were making. So we built another warehouse, made that one bigger, and then got that same call again, built another warehouse, made that one even bigger. Um, the climate over there actually is way different than where we're at right now. So they actually have four seasons over there uh, versus rain and <laughs> rain, more rain, rain here. Gray. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So and that's actually very important in the wh whiskey maturation. You want the temperature extremes. Um, so they get super hot summers over there, super cold winters. So we get a lot of good temperature swings to move that whiskey in and out of that char layer in that barrel. Now, was this was this by design? And you said like, oh, we want to build our warehouses here. Was it just, just I mean, there's a lot of things that happen in a, a startup and a you know, successful business. That part of it's just luck. So like kind of talk about that too. That was luck. We were not, in our business plan, we were not planning on storing whiskey over in central Washington where the climate's different. Um, but it makes sense. You it, know. It, it, you know, the answer was right in front of our nose the entire time. We just didn't realize it. And uh, yes, we have to truck the whiskey over there every week. Um, but we have grain coming from the farm every day, any, every week anyway. So we truck whiskey over. They unload the whiskey there and load the truck back with the grain. The grain comes back. John so. earlier was talking about how over there, the temperature is pretty similar to like Lexington or somewhere in Kentucky, but the humidity is much lower. So the if you look at the, the, uh, the air is drier, and so you get like more evaporation. If you actually look at um, the temperatures of of the months and compare them to Kentucky and Quincy over in Central Washington, they're almost identical. Um, but yes, the humidity is way lower there. So our outage is a lot more than they they see in Kentucky. Aging in that uh, drier environment, I think it gives our whiskey a unique taste. I mean, I can't prove it. But I guarantee if I send a barrel of whiskey down to a Kentucky Rick House and a barrel of whiskey over there on identical days and taste them, they'd be different, I think. We'll let you know. We'll, we'll take one. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can carry on one of these. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see, what, see what we can get on the plane with us. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, the other thing that, you know, I want, I want to kind of move on here to the rye whiskey as well. So kind of, kind of talk about the rye. Um, and then I've got another question for you after this. Yeah. So the rye whiskey. Um, everybody always asks us, why 100% rye? Rye not. Uh, I know I'm surprised Dave wasn't like 95.5, uh, you know, <laughs> doing that. Uh, so in the, in the beginning, um, we just realized a lot of the ryes in the market that were available, they were very bourbon-esque because they used a lot of corn. Um, they used maybe 51% rye, so they could be called a rye whiskey and uh, some malt. So to me, when I tasted a lot of ryes in the market, I was just like, this tastes too similar to bourbon. I want to make a rye whiskey that is you know you're drinking a rye whiskey. So we messed around with it. Um, and I don't know if you guys have ever heard about 100% rye production, but it is not a fun thing. Oh, it was nasty. Very, very uh, gummy. It's gummy, sticky. I invented my own four-letter words while making it. But uh, I found a way to tame the beast 
it's a pain in the ass to make, but it makes a damn, damn good whiskey. Yeah. I was going to say, where your fermenter is like overflowing, like. Oh, I, I'll show you video after the podcast, a really funny video that I got at one o'clock in the morning. I'll, yeah. <laughs> of a fermenter, <laughs> basically lifting the lid off the fermenter and mash just cascading out. Yes. Mm. It's foamy. It's messy. It's. It's a pain, but one of the one of the things you learn as you're starting down this path of actually distilling rye whiskey. Yes, yeah, it's it's one of those badges you earn for mm. sure. And it's really good. It's like a I, really creamy. It's and there's a sweetness to it that I yeah. love. Uh, yeah, there's like a citrus orange kind of flavor to it. Yeah, it's it's different than than most ryes out there. And yeah, because normally you get that like big bolt spearmint, you know, right in the face or dill. And I think it's uh, you know our rye is grown over in Quincy at the farm and. It, most rye whiskey, the, the rye is either from Canada, Montana, or they bring it overseas from Germany or, or something like that. So I think where that rye is grown is, gives it a uniqueness. So Brett, I kind of want to shift the conversation a little bit different direction. So uh, 2017 rolls around, you all start getting some, some phone calls for potential acquisitions. Kind of talk about that process. Like, did you expect it? Did you kind of hear some rumblings? Was it just out of left field did kinda, you want it or it it kind of was it was out of left field um we didn't really expect it and then when it started happening we were just like we're just getting to the good stuff we're <laughs> just now starting to bottle our stuff that's five years old and we're starting to get traction we're starting to win our backyard and we're like this is this is way too soon so we were kind of just dismissing it and then um Started having some conversations just to see, you know, it can't hurt to talk about things, right? Do, do you know, like, who, who tipped off? Yeah, how, why were they interested in you guys? Yeah. The story I've, I've heard is actually... Um, <clears throat> so it's still a mystery. No, I actually... <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, Dave has passed and he can't verify this, but um, apparently Dave was sitting in Jim Clerken, who is the CEO of Mo Hennessy's office, and Jim was looking at acquiring a whiskey brand and uh he had a bunch of names on the board and he asked dave's opinion and dave's like yeah those are all good bets but you're missing the one you should go after and jim's like well, what is that and he said woodenville he's like i've never heard of it he goes no one has because they listen to me and he's like what do you mean he goes they're only in washington state and they're killing it in washington state he goes their liquid is phenomenal you should look into them so that is how that put Moet Hennessy on our, our our radar. Sorry, the other way us around. on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Us on Moet Hennessy's radar. What was their goal with? I mean, obviously bourbon's big, but what what was their approach to you? Like, like what was their pitch to you for them to join them? Um, we actually had dinner with Jim, and uh, it was the longest dinner of my life. It was like four hours, but it didn't seem like that. It was amazing. It was a uh, great conversation. He basically was just like, we, we love your company. We love your product. We want to help you grow and we want you guys to run it. We don't want to change how you do things. You guys built this business. Why would we come in and screw it up type of thing? And he's the kind of guy that looks you in the eye, shakes you, shakes your hand and you're just like, you trust him. Yeah. And every word he has said has come true along this process. So my gut feeling is right in the beginning that he is a very upstanding individual and means what he says and does what he d says. It feels like you had your, your princess Jasmine and Aladdin moment. Like, do you trust me? And you yeah, just, yeah, you was, just went on the magic was, carpet. Oh, it boy. was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't, I didn't know where that was going. <laughs> <laughs> um, we just, we kind of, we looked at their brands and I mean, their brands are all iconic. They own the champagne market. Uh, they have some phenomenal scotches, the Glenmorangie and Ardbags. Yep. I know the brand here seems very different from their other brands. You know, this is like it is kind of blue collar. Like, yes, you know, 100%. you're in here, you know, putting grains up and everything. Whereas you think like Moet Hennessy, you know, it's like very lavish. Yeah, we are. We are uh, definitely. We don't fit in. <laughs> <laughs> which of the company Christmas which, party? Which I like. like uh, which I like. We're in our corner. No. Yeah, I got I got jeans at the company Christmas party. Yeah, they're gonna <laughs> they're gonna kick me out here soon. Yeah, I actually had to go buy a suit because I didn't own a suit at that time. So. Yeah, you invested all the money into the whiskey, right? Yeah, exactly. you didn't have any money for the fancy suits then. 
So, so kind of talk about, you know, the partnership and, and sort of what it's, it's, it's led to you. I mean, we all know that, you know, with these types of things, it, it comes capital, it comes the ability to expand, it comes the ability with, um, you know, basically hiring more people to satisfy, you know, growth and markets kind of, kind of talk about what that has meant to you all. Yeah, it's actually, it's, it's pretty awesome because where we were at without, without any kind of partnership or help, um, we probably would be in Washington state, maybe one other market, but what they've done is allow us to expand out into other markets. We, we wouldn't have had the resources to do so. It's allowed us to hire more people, um, more salespeople, and it's allowed us to basically see our dream of keep expanding the company and keep making the whiskey the way we've always made it, but just at a bigger capacity. Talk about the current, where, what states are you currently in and where are you trying to expand in the future? So we were in Washington state up until just last year and our first market was Northern California and then we went into Southern California. And then after that, we expanded into Oregon, uh, Arizona, Colorado, Illinois, Texas, Florida. Where's John? I yeah, no. <laughs> Where's my help? Where's my help? I think, yeah, yeah, no, we get it. Yeah, get I, it. I think that's I think that's where we're at right now, and we're looking to do uh, four to six more markets this year. And so, kind of also talk about you know not only with just you know market penetration and, and doing that, um, you know it's it's a it's a growth factor, and when you're in, and I guess you'd say we also are recording a little bit before you're getting ready to go on shutdown because uh, we learned before this that you're doing about seven barrels a day, mm -hmm. right? Which is for, you know, we talked to Heaven Hill and everybody else, then they're doing 1500, they're doing 1500 today, right? The, the, the size is pretty small, but you are looking at almost like doubling or tripling your capacity here relatively soon, right? Yeah. We'll go from, uh, we have a couple phases of expansion we're working on. We're actually going to start that expansion here in a few months. So once the first phase is complete, we'll go from about seven to eight barrels a day to about 21 to 24 a day. And then the second phase, uh, will basically get us up to about 48 barrels a day. So with that, you know, you've got this relationship with this one farmer that you've been working with. <laughs> Is he going to be able to satisfy that for you? 100%. Yeah. Okay. So we only, we, we, he grows all the rye based on our demand. So he, we give him our demands. He plants enough for us. Uh, corn, he has a pl plethora of corn. He's already planned for our expansion plans. He's already got seed in the ground to make sure we still get all of our supply from that farm. We'll see. It's like you're already figuring it out, didn't you? <laughs> Trying. <laughs> so there's there's another new expression you all are uh, releasing too, and this is the port finish. Correct. So, um, you know, we're not uh, shying away from, you know, barrel finishes and stuff like that. It's not new to the market, but what are you all trying to accomplish with doing a, a port finish type of whiskey? So obviously in the, in the beginning, we were trying to sell basically all the whiskey we had in barrel. We had to sell it to keep cash flow coming in. So as we've made more and more and more over the years, we've had more available. So we started playing around with different things and we want to try our own spin on a port finish. And it's our fully mature five-year-old bourbon um, that we rebarrel and to use port barrels for an extended period of time. And then it's bottled again at 90 proof, just like our bourbon. I feel like you put some like coffee beans in there. I know. Yeah. That's what I tasted. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Definitely get the port, but yeah, some like, deep chocolate kind of coffee notes as well yeah it's like it's like liquid dessert i don't know it's, really <laughs> <laughs> it's uh it's been one of our one of our most popular products out of our tasting room for sure really i mean yeah. i'm i'm well you are in wine country you know it's like true. it's like they're just coming off the wine taste like, yeah oh, it's yep. right in our wheelhouse i guess yeah was that a, was that an idea of like since you are in wine country that's like, like oh, just roll your barrels finish. over here yeah, I mean, no like, not necessarily it just well they we, probably don't make port here do they or do they uh there's a few okay there's a few but yeah, we're getting uh, we're getting the barrels from Portugal. So actually, like a Tani and Ruby Port. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm 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 in love with the rye whiskey as well. Gosh, the rye, both are incredible. The rye is like like you said, very unique and special. It's it is. It's very tasty. Now, is that also into the the five year category as well, or is that going to yep. be a little same, bit lower? Same spec as the uh, bourbon. It's it's a uh, it's the five year mark. So you all just stick with five as like your magic number here. Kind of is our magic number. So it just. It seems to work. Uh, to me, the, the whiskey is super balanced right at that point. It's got everything I'm looking for in that whiskey. And so we have let stuff go longer. And uh, we have some stuff that will release down the road, longer age stuff. But uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty good Is it with the, the arid, uh, 
you know climate over there is it is there a, like is the diminishing returns of the wood faster at a yeah we we have quite uh the bit of angel share we lose about 30 percent in five years oh wow so it's it's pretty high. You're like, all right, let's bottle it. <laughs> yeah, let's get, let's get that's not that's not why. Agent. That's Move not why. We, we don't let that dictate what we bottle. Bring it back to Wood and Bill, so, so it can be in the wet, humid climate. Yeah. and not not age as fast. And, and then again, with the the aging aspect, you know, as you continue to start building, you know, more and more warehouses on these this farm out there. I mean, are they are they all palletized? Are they are they ricking systems? Kind of kind of talk no, about them as well. We don't we don't do palletized uh, warehouses. Everything's ricked. So. Um, that's something Dave talked about with us too, is he just said, it's very important to get airflow over the barrels. So if you're palletized, they're all packed in tight. They can't get the airflow over the barrels. So we've always done a rick system. So when people are watching this video, make sure you explain exactly what's happening and why these yes, palletized so barrels are behind the us. The barrels behind us are barrels. That, that's how we ship them to the farm because it's easy to load a truck when they're on pallets and they're depalletized at the farm and ricked. Gotcha. Yeah. And then when they're brought back here for bottling here, correct? Yep. So we're currently bottling here. So they will actually palletize the barrels like over here and bring them back that way. Then we, we uh, unband them and we empty the barrels and get them ready for bottling here. Absolutely. So we're, during our expansion, we're actually going to do all the bottling and barreling over there. Uh, so we're building, that, building a barreling and bottling facility in Quincy. Um, this farmer in Quincy has got to be like, this is awesome. It reminds <laughs> me of like the McDonald's story where they found that one potato farmer. You yeah, know, and they're like, <laughs> he's, he's a he's a pretty popular guy in town. That's yeah. for sure. He is now. Yeah. Maybe that's yeah. what it is. Yeah. So also kind of, you know, as we start kind of wrapping up here a little bit, kind of talk about Orland a little bit. Like, um, what's what's the one thing that you admire about him? What's the one thing that you uh, you hate about him? <laughs> oh, God. Way to well, go, Kenny. Or, <laughs> or Great team my, turmoil. He's my best friend. Um, has been since college. We've... we've uh, seen and done a lot together so had a lot of cool adventures a lot of blackmail no i'm kidding yeah <laughs> yeah yeah he's got some on me too so i can't say too much yeah but uh his tenacity is what i admire most about him the guy is he he sees the prize and nothing's going to stop him from getting there so um i'm a pretty driven person myself but he takes it a step further so we were actually the perfect partnership in this. I'm, I'm the kind of guy who likes to get my hands dirty. I, I don't care. I will work 24 hours in a day to get things done if I have to. He's the same way. Um, but he's really got a, an amazing business sense um, in his little brain of his. <laughs> so It looked like he's on the picture. He's, he's taller than you, right? Oh, he's a giant. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's 6'4". So. Oh, wow. Basketball player. <laughs> um, he's, uh, yeah, his tenacity and he just... And, and his drive it, that that inspires me, and it, it's made me a, even a more driven person uh, over the years working together. And what's something about him that you're like, okay, this is this is pushing my butt. Where, where do y'all butt butt? Yeah, in? yeah. There's got to be something. Oh shoot, yeah. He uh, he's a big picture guy, so he misses a lot of the little details. So that that's Except where I like come me. in. Kenny's um, the detail guy. I'm like, ah, oh, let's just record. Yep, that's <laughs> a, that's exactly it. But that that we complement each other so well because. I'm 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 very detail oriented, and I fill in the gaps there where he's the big picture guy, and then these two heads together, um, push it over the finish line. Yep, it's making magic happen in the barrel. Yeah, that's what's happening. That's why yeah, we're here it's today. Great stuff. It, it it's a labor of love. It really is. I mean, it's the journey has been crazy. I can't believe this is going to be our ten year anniversary this year. Um, it doesn't seem like it's been ten years, but I I wouldn't have changed it for the world. It's I've learned so much. I've uh, met so many cool people and I've got so many awesome employees that have been with me since the beginning. I can't get rid of them. They just like to work here. <laughs> so <laughs> Can't fire them if you wanted to. They just keep coming back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then, so I guess, uh, you know, one of the last questions I also want to ask is, you know, you have a, we have a five-year product is, is kind of what you see as your staple product out there today. Um, talking earlier to John, which is, you know, doing a lot of the, uh, the work of actually getting you all into different markets. Um, you all are basically taking everything in five years. You're not holding anything back, uh, at least from from what he said. Is like, is there anything that in the future you might sandbag something? No, for, we've, for... we've we've got uh, we've got some stuff that we're going to stash for sure for longer aging. Um, but we're not telling you when it's coming out. You'll just you'll hear. Just come, you'll hear. It'll just happen. It'll happen. Absolutely. So, Brett, I want to say thank you again for coming on the show today. You know, it's fantastic to learn. You know about your story about Woodenville, and and honestly, for for how awesome this whiskey is, you know we we talk about it all the time that we have craft distillers send us 
bottles and we're just like okay here we go yep. this will be this will be yet another uh, grain forward kind of like bready tasting and this one you know like i said we were blown away from it from the very beginning and so we're we're excited to you know yeah do this this is yeah, gonna be fun we, as soon as we you know got the email back there i was so excited and pumped to come here i was like man that their whiskey is so good and uh, i appreciate you all having us and giving us this opportunity to be here it's really I, cool i i really appreciate you guys coming out here i mean i I could be on your podcast every day. I could talk with you all day. So um, we got time. Let's keep going. This, no, yeah. no, this is uh, <laughs> well. We got barrels pick. Uh, let's wrap this up. No, it's uh, it's it, it really is the story. It, it's the American dream. I mean, two best friends starting something from scratch, and some giant company finding this business and realizing that they want it as well, but they want you to stay involved and run the operations and still make all the decisions. At what point are you going to just say like, okay, like I'm not going to go move the forklift today. Like I just want to go ahead and relax at home. I, you know, it's funny. Everybody asks me, do you get sick of going to work? And I'm like, no, I wake up. I love going to work. I'm making whiskey for a living. I'm tasting whiskey. I'm picking barrels. I'm doing all this fun stuff. So it hasn't gotten old yet. So ask me in, in another 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take you up on it. Yeah. Yep. Sounds good. All right. So if you like what you hear, make sure you subscribe. Make sure you also write reviews. If you also want to help support the podcast, make sure you join uh, our Patreon community. It's something that, you know, this is uh, an opportunity where we are able to share Woodenville whiskey with a lot of our Patreon supporters as well. So make sure you go and check that out. Yeah. Thanks for having us again. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, if you have any reviews, suggestions, comments, feedback, we love hearing from our audience because uh, we're here for you. We want to keep bringing you content that you want to hear. So just give us a shout. We love talking to you. So uh, we'll see you next time. Cheers.